A few minutes ago, David asked me if I knew who was introducing me, and I said, no, I didn't, but now I do. And by the way, I'll expect a royalty check in the mail. It's an honor to be here, and so thank you, Renee and Alex and Mark, uh, for having me here, what's turning out to be one of the great experiences of my life. So now, just not to uh, screw it up. I wanted to talk about jungle-to-table cuisine, especially about that Chinese chef who recently died after having been bitten by the severed head of the cobra that he expected to have for lunch. But they asked me to talk about something frivolous instead. So I have chosen my career and how and why it was successful, and if it has any meaning for today uh, and the future but I'll have to put these on in case I... The first time I gave a speech to cooks and chefs was at the Culinary Institute of America at Hyde Park in New York. The dean had asked me to come and talk to the graduates and sort of give them some advice on what to expect going out and getting a job. I told them, if you come to work for me at STARS, the first week you'll learn how to prep lettuce. Actually, everybody at STARS got this, the bartenders, the waiters, everyone just to show what the commitment was in the basement of the restaurant, people getting ready for the day. Then I told them, you will learn the next week, you'll learn how to peel 20 pounds of tomatoes every hour. And all this time, you will work in the basement where all the ingredients are received and inspected and stored, because you will also learn that if the ingredients don't get in the hands of the line cook in perfect condition, it's all sort of worthless enough and means nothing. So then I told them in my concluding remarks, don't expect to be a sous chef within the first six months and put a down payment on a BMW. Half the room hissed, the other half booed. And I haven't given a speech in front of chefs and cooks since, <laughs> until now. So it is with some trepidation that I stand here, but looking around the room and seeing the company I'm in, I realize it's not time to be timid. So here goes. Even without a glass of champagne, I'm not sure it's possible. So who am I really? I'm the white guy from Harvard who would have gone down to take a look at Ron's carrot, if I'd known it had existed. <laughs> so it is all about ingredients. And my advice is still the same as it was to those graduates 20 years ago. Focus on ingredients and only dream about the car. It has always been about ingredients, was when I started, and more than ever is now. And I don't need the pedophile love Thank you, Fulvio, <laughs> for baby vegetables. And the menu, current menu language of sweety, crunchy, dairy, and all that horrible stuff. And I'm not that obsessed with the past, what was. But just because the past is the past does not mean it's over. No more than because the future is the future, it hasn't happened yet. And after all, the future was made yesterday. And if that isn't true, we wouldn't be standing here holding mad in our hands. But I do agree with David Chang after his visit to San Francisco restaurants. Fucking every restaurant in San Francisco is just serving figs on a plate. <laughs> do something with your food. Thank you, David. <laughs> I mean, Let's face it, we were just talking about it, let's face it, it nailed it to the wall that, at that moment. And San Francisco has no sense of humor about itself, so. <laughs> no wonder he's in such trouble. For my first days at Shape, as the chef of Chez Panisse in Berkeley in 1973, I was faced what, not what to do with figs, but with green beans. By the way, I'd never cooked in a restaurant before, I'd never had a job, and before that, or up to that moment, I was a failed architect. The world had failed to realize what a genius I was for underwater architecture. 
And so I was down to my last $25. You can't blame those Harvard professors for uh, firing me out of, out of the design school after I had summoned plankton like foraminifera to, the, to be the design for the structure of my underwater housing. And then I designed an underwater vehicle that was fueled with seawater. As I said, they threw me out of Harvard, so I had to go over MIT, and the professors looked at me and said, Jeremiah, you've redesigned the whale. <laughs> Way too many drugs. No wonder I was broke and answered the first job that I saw in San Francisco. This is the ad that Shapen East put in, in the newspaper. I showed up, and they gave me the job, just to show you how desperate they were. My first morning at work, the produce arrived at the kitchen door. And the first box I opened was a crate of Kentucky Wonder jumbo-sized green beans. Well, I said, no, I'm not going to use those, you know, and the guy said, you can't send produce back. You never do. And I said, well, we are now, you know, take them out of here. 30 minutes later, Alice shows up with one of the silent partners, who was a famous rock star lawyer. So I was a little bit nervous, and they said, no, you can't send produce back. Anyway, that guy's a friend of ours. I took off my apron, which I'd had on for about 30 minutes. I said, OK, you cook the fucking beans. I'm out of here, hoping desperately that they wouldn't accept me, because I had $7 at that point, and I had to get back to San Francisco, and the bus fare was 5.25. So what to do? in the following days. I stole nasturtium flowers on the way to work, dreamed of recreating a garden like my mother's in England. It was a one-acre vegetable and fruit garden. But at first, it was only a dream. Then one day, a month later or something, a guy shows up at the back door of the kitchen holding a great big king salmon that was obviously an hour out of the water. And he said, would you like to buy this? I ran to him and grabbed the salmon and said, buy it, are you kidding? Anything that comes out of that bay, you bring here and I will buy it. Not that we had any money, but I said I would. When I started buying huge and ugly conger eels for a perfect bouillabaisse, or mushrooms from, the, mushrooms from the local hills, the word got out. Since we cooked a different menu every day, and I never knew sometimes what the dinner menu was until about two o'clock, I had no trouble going out into the dining room and saying, you know, the chicken just doesn't make the uh, grade today. You're going to have to eat salmon that's four hours out of the water. Or telling them that bit the baby geese that we, I had bought a few months before were now grown, now confit, and now in the cassoulet and in the ovens for that night. And so on it went until the people at the back door got the idea to set up small businesses to sell us our ingredients to our specifications. So started the boots in the forest, or the back of a beaten up old VM, uh, VW van to table movement. My bean lesson, though, was when I was a teenager and my Russian aunt who taught me a lot about how to cook one day in Washington, D.C. supermarket, she said, you know, get me two pounds of green beans. So I carefully chose all the great big ones, you know, and put them in a bag, and she showed up, and I handed them to her. She said, no, darling, no, no, no. Only the little unformed velvety ones. So that was another 20 minutes of filling up the bag and a great lesson. So years later, I was ready for that lesson. I was ready for the jumbo Kentucky wonders coming in the kitchen of Chez Panisse and to send them back. That was my benchmark with beans. At the California Culinary Academy, years later after I left Chez Panisse, I gave lessons in benchmarks. I wanted to tell the students to show them or for them to figure out by themselves that quality is only barely subjective. To prove it, I gave a blind tasting in chocolate. I asked them, I had, you know, 15 chocolates or something, and I said, so, okay, what's your favorite chocolate? And everybody said Hershey bars. At the end of the blind tasting, lint came out top, 
Hershey was at the bottom, everybody agreed. So Lint became the benchmark until we found a better one. Then, as I say, so perfect ingredients were no mystery to me. Until, and I thought I knew how to judge them. And then one day, the founder of Connoisseur Wine Imports in San Francisco, George Linton, introduced me to a new world of defining quality. He gave me many lessons in the French growth called first, why they were, if they were, and were they worth the price. But the most dramatic lesson involved four each different vintages of Latache and Romani Conti side by side. These days, the price of a Romani Conti is twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a bottle, and Latache is three to four thousand. Is Romani Conti really worth four to five times Latache? We tasted them together, a close race. But what was that feeling that drinking the Romani Conti put one in a sensory realm that was previously uncharted, at least for me? Unless, of course, one had eaten with a spoon Petrosian beluga out of a kilo tin with hot buttered English muffins, or drunk a slight, an old and slightly chilled Chateau de Chem with cold roast goose on a summer afternoon. I'd done those once each, so I knew. Okay, we agreed. The Romani County is an, out there in a stratosphere of its own. Let me so, show you why, George said, drawing on his napkin. Whoops. I wasn't uh, putting my... Okay, that's Willie. No, I was right, sorry, sorry. Forward. That's the Kessel. Here is the benchmark scale, the zero. This is the scale we all know. From zero to 10, zero, obviously in 10, as I've been talking. This is the scale that everybody believes is zero to 10, with the belief that everything in this scale can be measured and proven. It is also the realm of relativism, an opinion that the idea that any opinion or taste is as good as another, and where the homogenizing of humanity occurs. And this, in the world of ingredients, is where Tyson Foods and Monsanto are circling their wagons with us on the outside. We are the Indians getting shot at out there where they would like to exterminate us. And this is where we're facing the extinction of the environment and its ingredients. But I agree with Alain Sondorance and Voltaire that taste is a matter of discernment. So here is another scale. Next should throw it in front of me. In this scale, as you can see, nine's down there. And George obviously made the point to me that the Latache is between zero and nine and the Romani Conti is from nine to 10, in that realm where nothing is proven but completely obvious when you've tasted it. In this scale, nothing can be proven, at least to lab scientists. It's just a matter of common recognition and agreement. I find that anything tasted in a group in this scale, everyone agrees that that is an ultimate experience. It's in that realm where I would serve a glass of Chateau de Chem with hot roast, uh, roast beef, and aged beef, and everyone will agree that that marriage is pushing us to a very instructive limit. Serve white wine, a big Chardonnay with cheeses, and the initially apprehensive looks around the table turn to a new wonder. For this, in this realm, the pinnacle of it for me is the Le Mans Rocher, from the Romani Conti, which I've t unfortunately tasted only twice in my life. But have a glass of that, and all the Chardonnays in the world will line up behind it. It is here that we can make sure there is a future, that we will find out what we'll be cooking next, and what will trickle down to the public, so they will say, 
no more to Tyson, no more to Monsanto, and say yes to eating only healthful and joyful ingredients. MAD is addressing both realms, but the nine to 10 benchmarks are also our guide through trends and what we create today of the future. We love trends, especially when we start them ourselves, but our f is our future really about one trend after another, the holy grail being the list of the next trend and then the one that comes after that? The future is not about trends, even though it'll be full of them. Renee thinks there's a big future in Mexican cuisine, which I do, and I'm particularly excited about matching it with Indian cuisine. Think of all those, sorry, matter, I'll have to call them curry pastes and powders, with the moles of Oaxaca, or the three ricados of the Yucatan, the green pumpkin seed one, the red achiote or anato one, and the amazing one called chimoli, which is made from blackened carbonized chilies, which is a world-class ingredient. Remembering that and looking back to the future, I think again of Escoffier and his Keep It Simple, Fait Simple, and wonder whether I actually ever followed that in my career. And a little more of Oscar Wilde from earlier today, where he said, simple is the last refuge of the complex. So let me talk about stars for a minute. There I did keep it simple with the food, cocktails and the wine program, Chateau de Cam by the Glass, for example. But the packaging of the message, the restaurant itself, was way over the top. The main reason for star success is that we were a team and usually stayed a step ahead of disastrous mistakes despite my best efforts. And here are some of the other reasons. The opening motto of stars, which I had to come up with on the first day when we opened for uh, dinner, when all the staff came to me and said, okay, so what, what are we doing here? You know, what's, what's this restaurant all about? I said, it's everything from blue jeans, less, to black tie, more. Johnny Apple from the New York Times called Stars the most democratic restaurant in the United States. There in the center is Denise Hale, the top socialite of uh, San Francisco, the woman who knew everyone, who had slept with everybody, and uh, kept their telephone numbers. She was the woman who could call Nancy Reagan when she was the, president, I mean, the wife's president, and everybody else in the world, and she brought them all to stars. So that's the photo of the two of us together in black tie. Um, but look at the photo above her, the head of the other woman. That's the photo of the gay bull riders from the San Francisco rodeo that stars had sponsored. Somehow, everybody, including Denise, got the point that they could be together there at stars. And that was one of its most magical qualities. As for the democracy of food at Stars, you could sit in the dining room and have a cocotte of braised sweetbreads with truffles and 100-year-old Madeira, or you could sit at the oyster bar and have you know, a glass of bilica saumon with a dozen uh, perfect oysters, or you could sit at the main bar and have a Stars hamburger and a glass of Lafitte. Really, it was everything for someone, more than something for everyone, though there was that too. The democracy of stars also included star power. Rudolf Noriev coming in after the opera, giving me a huge kiss and doing a jeté into his table next to Denise Hale, the whole restaurant rising up in an ovation. Pretty good stuff. Then there was Streisand and Armani, whatever president was in office, and lots more. Pavarotti was the most difficult. He insisted that everyone came, stayed 10 feet away and he always had to have a napkin, though I don't see it there, a napkin on his head because of the drafts. But it was the first time that the rich and famous and superstars were sitting in a public restaurant out in the open, mixing with, mixing 
with a government clerk from the court across the street, the owner of the hot dogs stand across from stars, and the groupies from all over town. Pretty heady stuff, and quite definitely, more is more. But it wasn't all about star power, either. Design had a lot to do with star's success. Specifically, the tension created by putting a huge bar with 50 seats, 50 stalls, across from the then radically open kitchen, with an oyster bar for single diners in between. So there's the open kitchen looking at the oyster bar. You can see the stools there. One of the kitchen line looking at the bar. And then the bar itself was that quote from Louis Pasteur at the top of the bar that wine is the most hygienic and healthful beverage known to man. That event was Julia Child's birthday, so we, there was a nice sculpture. We changed the, you know, the cocktails um, pretty much as often as the food. The bar got the same uh, attention that the food did, as did the wine program. But how did I get to all of that for being nearly fired for turning back shitty beans? As the story goes, if it had not been for a bunch of French cooks, California cuisine would never have been born. And I tell this story about marketing oneself and therefore one's restaurant because of its two messages. One, always be alert for the moment that will propel you into success, getting what you want, and two, be ever wary of getting it. My moment, when I first grabbed that galloping horse going by me, was at lunch in 1983 for uh, 100 journalists at the Astor Mansion in Newport. The event was to introduce Guy Savoie to the United States press, and he was cooking the dinner, so they invited a bunch of kids in from California to do the lunch. We showed up in the early morning to the kitchen, and the French chefs told us to get lost. You're not coming in. I mean, you know, kids from California, what, what it would, why would they let us in? Um, that, that was the moment. And I looked around, and I said, OK, kids, follow me. We're setting up on the lawn. We had six six-foot grills. You know, they got us, and we had a 1,000 pounds of charcoal that we'd brought in from California since there were only briquettes in the United States, in the East Coast. And is that flashing zero, so meaning I'm out of time? Uh-oh. <laughs> OK, a couple more minutes. So we set up on the lawn and cooked this menu. It ended up, of course, astonishing all the journalists because we had to cook everything on the charcoal grills. But what really stormed their imagination is when we grilled the dessert. Picture four cooks in white, each with a saute pan full of berries for the dessert, tossing as high as we possibly could without making fools of ourselves or wasting the dessert. A week later, a hundred food sections appeared in the United States. Uh, first, for the first time in color and the first time full page, and all the headlines screaming things like, mesquite is it, grilling is it now. It's hard to believe that these were, they were new at that time, but they were. And then for the first time, the words California cuisine and enormous letters across the food section were spread all over the United States. Overnight, we were famous, and overnight, a new cuisine was announced to the world. In the plane back to California, my cooks were ecstatic at our victory. One of them looked back at me over the seat, since I was sitting behind them, and saw tears on my face. He was horrified, then puzzled. No worries, I told him. It's just that we got what we wanted. And God help us all from now on. So why did I concentrate on stardom after that? Sorry, Fulvio, but I did in the early 1980s, as well as the food service, the wine, and the bar. To get the message across that we were not servants, relegated to the kitchen basement and the servants' hall, to show loudly and clearly the really important message that a successful restaurant 
did not have to be for the rich elite. It could be great and popular in that true sense of the word as well. But once on the road to fame and success, it was hard to get off. And the Doers National Billboard came in and hell broke loose. Soon Time Magazine said that I'd had more publicity than Meryl Streep, as ludicrous as that sounds. But a week later, I did have my BMW. <laughs> and finally, to answer Renee's question to Alain Sondrons of what keeps one going. For me, it's the ingredients. When I wander, you know, after my coffee, wander around a little town in Italy or France or someplace, and you see those huge squash flowers. When I'm in Galicia in the winter, and there's an enormous storm, you know, coming off the Atlantic, and you see a big basket of pesebes at the entrance to the restaurant. You know, I just, well, I'm getting goosebumps now. Mainly because they're so expensive, I guess, now. So that always makes me want to get back in the business. Actually, uh, I hope to find an email today when I get back to the hotel that says I am. But that's just breaking news. But I do hate restaurant bureaucracy. I have never lost my love for perfect ingredients. I want to thank the team, Ali and Gabe and Mark and James, and all of you at Noma on both sides of the wall, of the kitchen wall, since no at Noma, there isn't one. And by the way, the teams who gave us those three pretty wonderful lunches. But to close with, I want to give you the advice from Elizabeth Taylor to me. When the going gets rough, put on your lipstick, pour a cocktail, and get on with it. Thank you.